Well, hello, and welcome to the Climate Disclosure Standards Board webinar on practical steps to take following the release of the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, recommendations. My name is Simon Messenger, and I'm the Managing Director of the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, or the CDSB, as we'll now refer to it. We have a fantastic panel of speakers today, and I'm delighted to be joined by just over 100 attendees from around the world. So good morning to those of you joining us from Europe, good afternoon to those of us of you joining us from Asia and Australia, and I'm really quite sorry for those of you in North America, I realize 5 a.m. wasn't particularly ideal. The aim of today's webinar is to provide you with some practical steps for the implementation of the TCFD recommendations. This is why we encourage you to send us questions throughout the webinar, which we will uh, answer at the end. Please use the chat function to this effect, which is in the top right corner of the screen, uh, not the Q&A uh, button. I don't know exactly why, but I'm told that the chat one is the one that you want to be using. So talking today are three panelists who are experts in non-financial reporting and the TCFD. Our first speaker is Gordon Wilson. Gordon is a senior manager at PwC and is the chair of our technical working group, uh, which is one of our governance bodies, which draws on global experts and sets our technical agenda. We also have Jane uh, sostrup Yagd, who is dialing in from Denmark. She is the lead researcher at the Center for ESG Research, which is an internationally renowned think tank and was previously the lead compliance officer at Merckst. And finally, and last but not least, we have Nadine Robinson, a lawyer by training and CDSB's technical director, and she leads the development of all of our technical work program. Before I hand over to Nadine, I am aware that most of you will know what CDSB does and how it supports the TCFD recommendations, but for those of you who don't, a very quick overview and introduction. So CDSB is an international consortium of uh, businesses and environmental NGOs. We help companies report climate and natural capital information in their mainstream reports through our framework, and this helps companies provide decision useful information to the market and investors. We've been advocating for uh, more or less the same goal as the task force for the last 10 years, and therefore hope that the insights that we will be providing you with today will be extremely valuable. Uh, so to start off with, I will hand over to Nadine, and she's going to give us an overview of the TCFD and the points we will be covering today. Thank you, Simon. Good morning, everyone. Just um, to start off with, to um, bring to attention that um, the essential objective of the task force recommendations which is to encourage organizations to both evaluate and disclose as part of their financial filing preparations and reporting processes the material climate-related risks and opportunities most pertinent to their business activities. So the report that was released uh, includes three, a main report with the recommendations themselves, a second um, report on implementing the recommendations, and finally a technical supplement, supplement on scenario analysis. This um, slide um, is just pulled from the main report and um, emphasizes the four core elements of the recommended climate-related financial disclosures, so relating to governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets. And within these, there are supporting disclosures under each. The next slide um, is, is an interesting one because it presents the implementation path or um, adoption curve for the um, TCFD outcomes. And as you can see, the key point to emphasize here is that this is a process that, that will take a period of time. So we don't, um, the TCFD doesn't expect everyone to be at the top of the adoption curve immediately. So our um, activities or our presentation today is um, looking at um, following on from the checklist we, we produced earlier this year on how to implement the recommendations with practical steps where you can start. So we have a 10-point checklist which covers everything from internal collaboration and integration. Secondly, mainstreaming of climate-related risks and opportunities and financial impacts. Making the most of your company's risk management processes. Using existing quality assurance and compliance processes for identifying and evaluating climate risks and financial impacts. The fifth pointer relates to using the existing tools to assemble your evidence base. Six, suggestions on linking climate and financial information. 
seven, engaging investors for feedback. The eighth pointer relates to reporting as if your report is going to be assured. Ninth relates to multi-scenario analysis. And finally, using the mainstream report as your principal vehicle for disclosure. Good. Th thank you very much, uh, Nadine. Um, as, as she suggested, we, we've been working on this for a number of uh, well, years, and particularly last year uh, with regards to TCFD, and we'd love to go through each of these points today, but if we did, we would run out of time uh, because we'd go into quite a lot of technical depth. So what we've done is that we've, we've selected uh, five of the points, which we'll now uh, start going through, and I'll hand over to each of the um, relevant uh, panelists to talk uh, about. Uh, but if you do want to find out more uh, afterwards, um, about each of these points um, and the ones that we don't uh, cover, you can check our website because we have a full list of tips and some uh, narrative around it. So the first uh, point we want to talk about is about risk management processes, uh, and I'm going to hand over to uh, Jane now, uh, who will give us an overview of how to deal with the risk management process. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, the first thing that I would like to highlight is, of course, that your audit committee in your board will have to commit to this, because otherwise it will be quite difficult for you to make this fly. Um, but once that is in place, I would say that you can actually reuse the tools that you already have. What you have to do is to extend them to also cover the climate risks. This, this means that uh, often the, the risk assessment is made with a, with a chart where you have two axes. One is on the impact side and one is of the likelihood of the risks taking place. And the extension will most likely have to happen on the axis of impact. Some companies, they measure their impact um, on multiple impact, impact measurements. That would be like reputation and also, of course, on the, on the financial side. And if you have multiple measurements, uh, then you should potentially also include physical risks as one of your measurements devices. But there are also many companies who do not have different kinds of measurements, and they only use the financial terms. Either way, it is quite important when you make the risk assessments that you have a co-work between your financial and non-financial co-workers. And I must admit to you, this will be the trickiest part because they are often in different worlds and they have a hard time co-working. But I have a few tricks up in the sleeve. One of them being that this is not something that you are only doing at the headquarters. This is also something you do out in the entities and your reporting entities. And it's quite important that you try to establish teams consisting of both financial and non-financial people. They have different abilities, and it's important that you praise these different abilities because when you co-work, then you actually get better. And um, if you look at the financial employees, they're really, really good with reconstructure and evidences and they know the discipline. And this is good for your data quality, and it's good for your enterprise risk management process. But on the other side, your non-financial employees are often very inventive. They are good at knowing the processes, and therefore they may also be able to reduce your net risks because they know how to actually mitigate some of the risks that you may find out that you have. And then a final good trick is actually to share the best practices across the company. Um, often uh, reporting entities do not want advisors from the headquarters but they really, really like to get advices from other co-workers and other reporting entities. So if you can make a best practice library in SharePoint or something like that, super simple, nothing fancy fancy, then you will actually see that it will flow, fly, fly much, much better out in the organization because, uh, for, first of all, they know this has been done, this is something that works, and on the other side, you will also see that people get quite proud about inventing good solutions. That was it. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jane. And, and the part around establishing you know, teams of financial and non-financial people is, I think, critical and, and really interesting and something that I think all, all of us and all organizations can uh, take going forward. Um, Gordon, so building on that, could you, could you follow up on the points around uh, building on one's evidence base and what you think are the, the, the best steps to take um, in the media? 
Sure. Thank, um, thanks, Simon. So um, I think when, whenever you have uh, something new that, that comes out, uh, the, there is all, always um, the, the, the chance of skepticism and, uh, uh, and, the, and a drive for, do we, do we really have to do this? And if we do have to do this, how, how are we going to start? And I think it, it's really about making that, uh, uh, those initial first steps are, are the most challenging. Um, and the reality is, you know, we're, we're all going to have to do something, but there's lots and lots of things that, we've, that, that most organizations have already done to really help you, uh, you start. Um, so at PwC, we, we look at um, uh, about 400 companies reporting every year as part of our Building Public Trust uh, Awards, and we've had a look at who already are starting to report around um, TCFD. And I'd say, uh, you know, already we can see there are around 10 or so companies uh, within the FTSE 100, 250 that are starting to make, um, you know, are making a good stab at uh, looking at some of the risks and disclosures around this. Um, and, and perhaps there's, there's up to about sort of 30 or 40 who, who have taken some first steps. So in terms of looking at the outputs, you know, we're already seeing uh, some of those more leading organizations being able to provide what does, what does good look like. And I would expect that over the next reporting cycle, those, those numbers will, will increase. If we think about how do I start, um, it, you know, We've got 6,000 people responding to CDP. Already you have started to submit the basic building blocks uh, around the information that needs to be gathered and, and, and prepared. And, and I think for a lot of organizations, the, the, the trick is taking what is already being gathered, what is already being submitted, and building that into something that is more uh, consistent and, uh, and comparable uh, on, a, on an annual basis. And, you know, uh, I know Nadine is going to talk a little bit further about, um, you know, the CDSB framework, but, you know, that framework provides a, uh, a, a sort of standard ready, something that is uh, applicable for reporting within annual report and accounts, um, the, the, the level of detail and rigor that needs to be built around the information that, that needs to be disclosed. Jane talked about, uh, you know, risk management, and I, and I think that that's very important to, to think of the tools that are already embedded within an organization, you know, risk registries, disaster recovery plans. You know, the, there's, a, there's a wealth of what, what I might call operation models that, that are already being used by many organizations. And, and the trick here is to actually work alongside those uh, and, and expand the scope. And it, it, this reiterates Jane's point. It's expanding the scope of a lot of what is done around risk management, financial planning, um, you know, and, and more broader reporting. Um, and so in order to take those initial steps, my, I, I really think that, that actually the biggest tool is actually the other people within your organization. So whether that's people from the finance side who are going to be experts in financial planning, they're going to be experts in, in working out um, you know, returns on investment. These are all simple tools that are going to be needed for, uh, for when you think about scenario analysis. Um, governance and internal audit, you know, they will be managing risk registers. They will be uh, uh, assessing you know, what is the risk and impact. Um, so so the, that scenario planning is, is, is something that they're comfortable and, and have experience around. Um, you know, OGC um, are going to be other people who are involved in, in reporting and how, how do we report in, in a way that enables us to um, a, apply the, the TCFD in a, in a risk-free basis. So I think there are a number of tools that we've already got out there. There's some building blocks in terms of, uh, of information. There's, there's some way, you know, and that comes from, from CDP returns. There's ways in which you can build on that to create something that can be reported 
uh, in a coherent and, uh, and, and clear way, and, and you know the CDSB framework is, is one of those. And there are and there are, there are the people and processes within your organisations uh, that you can leverage from. Cheers, Gordon. Um, thank you very much for that. And as you said, I guess to companies, don't be alarmed that it will be too difficult. There are a lot of frameworks out there that um, you know one can use. You know, whether it's CDPs or CDSPs, you know, which help build an evidence base. There's a lot out there, and a lot of people can, uh, can help um, towards uh, complying with the, the recommendations. So, Jane, once we've collected all this evidence, what insights can you provide us on the best approach to providing both quality assurance and further to that external assurance on the data? Um. Well, first of all, uh, it's a matter of that your governance process is potentially also just extended. You don't have to invent new tools here either. So what is important is that your already existing controls, for instance, for your impairment testing, is uh, extended to also cover the climate risks and the impact it will have on your financial, on your, long, uh, on your uh, physical uh, assets and the in intangible assets. It's quite important that you consider whether this impairment testing also should uh, take care of that. Uh, your testing and your controls for completeness of your provisions will have to also include the climate risks. That is quite important. And your controls for off-balance sheet items that will be contingent liabilities and assets, of course, also have to, uh, to cater for the climate risk. What is potentially less useful or used today, you could say, uh, is actually that you also need to be sure that the CO2 that you are reporting now in the financial report will have to have the same controls as you have for your ordinary financial elements. And that means that you have to be sure that the CO2 combustions are complete and valid. And it's actually not very complicated to do it. You just have to consider that you should look at the combustions so it's quite important that, that you're out in your reporting entities make sure that you have controls that make sure that your combustions are right. And then at the headquarters, then you do the calculations into CO2. That is how you do it in, in a good way, because if you do it on the combustions, then you can actually compare it with the production and with other financial elements. And then you have co uh, a context for your data. And that's the only way whereby you can ensure that it's actually complete and valid. Another thing is that the new kit on the block, that will be the scenarios, you can actually also make sure that that data is, uh, is uh, made with rigor and you can actually use the same logic as you have, for instance, for your provisions and your off-balance sheet items, um, which are neither uh, having strong, strong, strong uh, documentation like you would have for CO2, but it is another kind of documentation which you should also do for your scenario details. Um, once you have that in place, your governance process will go on as it is today, where you look at what can go wrong and how do you know you have your evidences in place so that you are sure your data is of good quality. And of course, these new controls should be included in your control catalogs. And of course, you should establish SOPs for it. And it's quite important that you also monitor that all the controls are performed. When you have all this, it's actually also easier for you to report back to the audit committee so that they know what kind of data they have, what is the quality of it, how can they actually make decisions based on this data. So, so the, for the governance process, it's more of the same, but it's potentially in a new area. That was it. Okay, and did, did you, uh, want to touch on uh, the uh, extor external assurance? That's it. Or Gordon, do you want to start off on that, please? Uh, sure. So, so I think in terms of um, how information ends up in a annual report and accounts, um, and often a lot of this non-financial information may may previously have been reported within sustainability reports or core responsibility reports. And, and then, you know, there, there may have been a few additional disclosures that, that fall into um, annual report and accounts. I think the focus around the TCFD is that this is information that needs to be included within the, you know, the main annual report and accounts. And, and as a result, 
you know, the levels of, of rigor and review uh, and the timeliness of that information uh, becomes um, paramount. So whether, whether you seek to have assurance or not, you know, and, and, and that, that's, that's a, a, a separate debate, you know, the, the way in which you prepare that information and report that information, you know, needs to very much follow the, the, the key principles around uh, how you would do so were, were it to be financial information. And, and in terms of, from my experience, I, I think this falls into um, three, three areas. The first is, is actually just getting the basics right. Um, and I'll come on to that in a minute. The, there's, there's then, you know, part two is, is that there are two key aspects around having information that is what I might call assurance ready uh, or audit ready. Uh, and thirdly, when we look at the output and the outcome, uh, and the reporting, um, the, there, are, there are the four C's that, that we shall follow on. So those, those are my sort of three things, and, and I'll, I'll build on those um, each. So first of all, getting the basics right. Um, far too often I see uh, scenarios where we've got one individual who is gathering all of this information is uh, this information is coming through in spreadsheets and emails and they are gathering it all, putting it all into some form of report um, and, and then it's, it's being signed off by, by someone who hasn't really spent the time to, to, to review it. Um, and that just is, you know, so risky, so likely to fall down. So what is the basics, right? You know, simple things around who is the preparer of this information? Who is the reviewer of this information? Who is going to finally approve uh, the information and the report that, uh, that it's going to drive? So thinking about who those three individuals are, documenting who they are, um, and, and then building that into the, the, the program around how the information is, is gathered, analyzed, and, and reported. What are the systems that are being used uh, and, and what is the appropriate uh, way in which those systems uh, will be used? You know, if it is Excel, that then comes with a whole load of additional risks so, and, and that needs to be factored in and, and additional uh, amounts of review or, or, um, or, or checking needs to be done. What are the areas of judgment? What are the sources of the factors that have, that have been used um, and how are they all going to be brought about? How is this all being documented uh, and, and what is the level of evidence that's, that's available to support it? Those are all you know, very s simple, basic things for financial reporting and they need to be applied in the same context uh, around some of this information here. I think also, uh, a very important step is around the interaction uh, with governance and, and whether that is the audit committee um, or, or whether it's the audit committee chair, etc. You know, how well have they been involved in the strategy and planning of the, this information? You know, have they been kept informed during the evidence gathering process? Um, and made aware of any problems or challenges or limitations that's been involved. Because come the point at which uh, reporting needs to be approved and, and, and made public, they need to feel comfortable that they've been made aware of all of these challenges and these issues uh, and there aren't any you know, last minute um, uh, points which um, you know, they will then get uncomfortable. And you know, all too often in non-financial information, I see certainly in my experience is, is that you know governance organize, you know governance committees are getting information that isn't quite ready to be made public. It's it's too late, um, and their their ability to adequately challenge it um, is is diminished. Uh, and I give you a real life example where uh, you know an organisation was publishing their first. Um, a non financial report of, of various uh, environmental information. The board was all taken through 
uh, the, the report, they questioned it, they challenged it, et cetera, and then the, uh, then the chairman said, right, okay, well, I think we're there, so um, who's, who's going to sign this off? And there was a silence around the table, and there was no show of hands, and he just said, well, in that case, we're not publishing it. He says, until someone on this board is willing to stick their hand up and say, I'm prepared to commit this organization to, to what we're, we're reporting, I don't think this information is ready. So I think those are the sort of simple, simple sort of uh, things that people need to be building into this, uh, to this reporting, um, you know, to think of it very much in the same way as, as other financial information that's included in the annual report and accounts. So that's step one, getting the basics right. Step two, you know, what are the key, the two key aspects to 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 having data that is assurance ready? Um, and this falls into two traps. Two, uh, sorry, not trap. Uh, this falls into two buggers. I think first of all, uh, you need to have uh, some clear reporting criteria. Uh, um, that is both appropriate and relevant for the information that's going to be uh, good. What do I mean by that? It's the way in which the data that's been reported, how has it been calculated, what are the methodologies, um, and ultimately that document uh, ought to be publicly available. Um, and certainly if it is going to be subject to external assurance, it needs to be publicly available. Because, and the test is, you know, whether someone can go and take that same information and apply that reporting criteria and come up with the same answer. You know, that's the key test. So that's an important step, and it can be very helpful uh, for organizations to actually spend time to go through uh, that, that, that report. It can help um, internally uh, around educating those that are going to be helping to prepare the data it gives them the, uh, the, the, the bigger picture of how it's going to be presented. The second key aspect to, uh, to assurance is, is actually around the audit trail and how well uh, the evidence of information is, is retained um, and uh, such that, again, some, someone can go back in, into, the, into the trail and be able to find and re-perform that, that evidence. So, um, that, is, that is often something that, uh, you know, we find as, as, a, as an assurance provider that the, the audit trail just isn't there. It isn't in a robust fashion, and, you know, there can be simple steps that need to be made to, to, to ensure it goes forward. So some, some simple things, uh, hopefully, around how, how do you get to the point at which you've got information um, that is ready to be reported. Uh, and the final aspect I wanted to talk about is, is how it gets reported um, within the annual report and accounts. And, and this is where my point three is, it's actually not three, it's, it's the four C's. And the four C's are clarity, completeness, uh, consistency, and comparability. Um, so clarity is really about making sure that the information is, is clear and concise. So that's another two Cs, might be subset Cs. Um, it, it's in an understandable way and, and to, to those that are reading, be that uh, investors, be that management, uh, they can understand what, what the key messages are. Um, completeness is very much around whether the information is, is fair and balanced. Uh, have you captured all the, key, all, all the relevant reporting units? Um, are, are there, if there are any limitations in terms of uh, the information that's been gathered, has that been fairly uh, explained and, and, um, and the context put in? Um, and um, you know, it, it needs to be a warts and all. Uh, it can't be selective. Um, good, good news stories. It, it needs to be that fair and balanced. Um, consistency is, um, is, is a real challenge actually for, for year one, but it is about really making sure that you've done that rigorous uh, planning step that says, I will be able to report in this fashion year on year. I will use similar or the same assumptions uh, and the areas of judgment that I will apply will be consistent year on year, such that I start to build a, 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 a picture and a history 
of, uh, of consistent reporting. Now, obviously, where you do make changes, you can document them. And again, that comes back to that clarity piece that you're being clear and uh, unambiguous about um, the changes that you made. Um, and lastly, the comparability um, side of things is, is, is recognizing your, your peers, your competitors, um, others within your um, industry, others within your, um, uh, your, your, your capital markets. Are you preparing and reporting on something that can be compared uh, against them? Now, you know, that, that is a challenge. Every organization is unique. Um, but, but within a, a market, within a sector, um, one, one always expects um, some comparability to, to, to emerge. Um, and where you might be different, that's where you need to provide that clarity around why you're different. So some, some simple steps around, one, getting the basics right, two, uh, uh, applying the rigor uh, around reporting criteria and, and evidence trails that makes this information uh, assurance standard ready. Uh, and lastly, uh, just applying those four C's around how you report something um, to, to the stakeholders who, who are going to be absorbing and reading and acting upon this information. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Gordon. That's a, a great crash course in external assurance for, <laughs> for everyone. And I think you, I mean, you say the three main steps are really important. And you know, again, the basics, you know, around the, who's the prepared, the review and the approval of the data, making sure there's the right interaction with the governance and using the right systems. And your last, you know, your last four C's, uh, clarity, completeness, consistency, and comparability are a great way of remembering what, uh, what needs to be done. So um, we, we want to spend probably the next 10 minutes uh, with Nadine talking a little bit more about um, some of the new elements of the TCFD, TCFD recommendations uh, and the scenario analysis part and obviously the focus on the mainstream reports. So Nadine, I'll hand over to you for, to walk through some of these essential steps. Thanks, Simon. So to begin with, um, I'd just like to address how can you deal with scenario analysis, as Jane referred to, the new kid on the block. Checklist pointer nine suggests that companies assess business against various scenarios. The TCFD final report notes that while climate change risks are affecting some organizations today, for many, the most significant effects of climate change are likely to emerge over the medium to longer term, with uncertainty around their timing and magnitude. The task force encourages organizations to undertake not only historical, but forward-looking analysis when considering impacts of climate change on their businesses. There is a clear need to consider and assess how climate-related risks and opportunities may evolve and potential business implications in the future. Scenario analysis offers you one tool for understanding strategic implications of climate-related risks and opportunities. To put it another way, it is a tool for assessing how climate change may affect your business over the short, medium, and long term. Scenario analysis is a hypothetical construct, which allows you to highlight key elements of a possible future. A scenario is an alternative, plausible future state. It is not a prediction or forecast. We've been able to pull out four pointers from the task force technical supplement on scenario analysis, which should give you some guidance on how you might approach the process of undertaking such analysis. The first step is to draw on your use of existing disclosure and reporting frameworks for reporting climate-related information. This can serve as the starting point for information to use in your scenario analysis. Second, start with qualitative analyses or storylines and then move to quantitative ones. The third pointer is to include scenario analysis in both your strategic planning and enterprise risk management processes. And finally, the task force suggests that you adopt a six-step process to applying scenario analysis as outlined in the slide in front of us. In this first step, Jane has already spoke about the people in your organization as a key tool. So start with the people first. Ensure sure the correct governance mechanisms are in place. Next, step two, focus 
through materiality assessment. Thirdly, you can now identify which scenarios to use in their scope. The task force suggests you apply five characteristics when considering possible scenarios in scope. That they be plausible, distinctive, consistent, relevant, and provide challenge. At the same time, the task force suggests you make use of publicly available scenarios. So begin with the IEA and IPCC scenarios when developing and tailoring your organizational specific scenarios. These should provide you with the content and macro trends for your organization or sector. A key point is at minimum to use the two degrees Celsius or lower scenario, plus others most relevant to your company's circumstances, whether they be NDCs, business as usual, or physical climate risk scenarios. The take home point here is the emphasis is on multiple scenarios, not just one. Next, undertake your assessment of impacts on the business from these alternative plausible future states, both in terms of strategy, financial performance, and also risk management. Finally, chart your course for action. What are you going to do or could do as a result of your assessment? Can you identify potential responses or mitigation measures? Finally, document the above process. Disclose your inputs, your key assumptions, your analytical approach, outputs, and management response. So we have offered some initial thoughts on how you might approach scenario analysis, but what will you actually disclose in your report as a result? What will be the extent of your disclosures? The task force has identified some non-financial companies whose practices may be worth a further look. These include, include BHP Billiton, Statoil, ConocoPhillips, and Glencore. We note today that a significant minority of the registrants to, to our webinar are from non-financial companies. The final report offers four key aspects which non-financial companies may wish to disclose through their scenario analysis. You can consider these points by asking the following four questions. Which scenarios did you use, including the mandatory two degree Celsius or lower scenario? Two, what were the critical input parameters and analytical choices for the scenarios you chose? What were your assumptions about technological responses and timing, for example? What time frames did you use for your scenarios? And finally, how resilient is your organization's strategy? Resilience includes looking at potential material financial implications for the organization's operating results and financial position, and also for your strategy and financial plans. But coming back to this a little bit further, what if you are new to scenario analysis in this context? The task force acknowledges the importance of proportionality of the scenario analysis to your circumstances of your particular company. The approach taken will therefore depend on your needs, resources, and capabilities. They do, however, offer some thoughts on what organizations should, quote, strive to achieve in the process of such consistency of methodology from year to year. See in particular page 29 of the final report. This is in keeping with the task force expectation that capacities in this area will be built over time. So now if we move on to our final tip in the checklist, which Gordon and Jane have also touched on already. Checklist pointer 10 is about using the mainstream report as the principal vehicle for disclosing climate-related risks and opportunities of relevance to your business. I'd like to begin this point with a point of clarification on the term mainstream report. Within CDSB, when we use the term mainstream report, we are referring to the annual reporting packages in which organizations must deliver their audited financial results by law in the respective jurisdiction where they operate. For example, many G20 countries require material risks, including those on climate, to be disclosed in the mainstream report. These mainstream reports, as Gordon has already said, are usually available in the public domain. The mainstream report offers investors information about the financial position and performance of the organization. While specific requirements may vary by jurisdiction, a mainstream report typically contains financial statements and other financial reporting, such as management commentary or governance statements. The task force has adopted our CDSB definition of mainstream report on page 17 of its final report, although they refer to mainstream annual financial filings or simply financial filings. These terms are synonymous with each other. The key point 
to take away here is that both CDSB and the task force advocate for reporting of climate-related risk and opportunities to be done largely through the vehicle of the mainstream report. The task force makes, makes it explicit on page 34 that, governance, that disclosures about governance and risk management recommendations should be provided for in the mainstream report as climate-related risks affect nearly all sectors. However, for the core elements of strategy and metric and target disclosures, organizations should provide such information in the annual financial filings where it is deemed to be material. That said, the TCFD also suggests an applicability threshold where non-financial organizations, i.e. in the energy, transport materials, and building and agriculture, food, and forest product industries slash groups may consider disclosing information on these two core elements when it is deemed non-material. The threshold is $1 billion U.S. dollars equivalent in annual revenue and is relevant for a captured nine-tenths of scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions in these industries. The task force felt that these organizations are more likely than others to be affected financially over time due to their significant greenhouse gas emissions, water, and energy dependencies, and therefore investors would want to monitor the evolution of their strategies. While this is the last point in our checklist, and we have spent time already touching on many aspects of reporting processes, this is perhaps one of the most fundamental steps for a company to take to make progress on achieving the outcomes sought by the TCFD. To recap, as I mentioned earlier, the main objective of the TC recommendations is to encourage organizations to evaluate and disclose, as part of financial filing preparations and the reporting processes, the material climate-related risks and opportunities most pertinent to their business activities. So you, men, you might then ask, why the push for disclosure in the mainstream report? The task force argues that disclosure in the mainstream report should do two things. First, it should encourage shareholder engagement. And secondly, it should foster wider use of such climate-related financial disclosures. The task force notes that in doing so, this should better inform that investors and other shareholders' understanding of climate-related risks and opportunities. This will also affect the quality and decision usefulness of climate-related financial information by ensuring that appropriate government governance, by ensuring that appropriate controls govern both the generation and disclosure of such information. In fact, they go so far as to say that the processes governing production and disclosure of information would be similar to those in use for existing public financial disclosures, including review by the company CFO and audit committee. We also see that the TCSD and CDSB's shared emphasis on reporting climate-related financial information in the mainstream report will help to better link climate and financial information and to move us closer towards equating financial capital with natural capital. So how do you put this into practice? How can your company use its mainstream report structure for climate-related financial disclosures, and where might one start? CDSC has two frameworks on climate change and natural capital to help you evaluate and assess your information on climate-related risks and opportunities and make related disclosures in your mainstream report. The first is our original climate change reporting framework from 2011. The second, our 2015 re framework on reporting of environmental information and natural capital. Both use the vehicle of the mainstream report. They consist of a set of principles and requirements to aid you in the process of identifying, preparing, and assessing information and making actual disclosures. They were prepared in line with other objectives of financial reporting and reporting approaches offered by other organizations. We also offer some practical suggestions in these frameworks for how to approach the placement of information in the mainstream report. For example, we suggest you adapt rather than expand the information in the mainstream report. You might want to intersperse information on climate-related risks and opportunities in the relevant sections of the report, which explain their connection to your business's performance and strategy. In TCFD language, this would entail linking climate risks and opportunities to core elements of governance, strategy, and risk management, where they already sit in your annual report, and to ensure inclusion of metrics and targets is appropriate. In the climate change framework, we advise that information must be reported in a place and a manner so as to explain the links between an organization's strategy, operations, and climate change impacts. There is insufficient time in this webinar to go into detail through each of the guiding principles and requirements as listed on the slide, which will help you identify, prepare, and assess information and disclose. 
However, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that if you follow the CDSB's framework, Disclosal Principles, you're also adhering to the task force Disclosal Principles. For example, shared principles related to relevance, consistency, and comparability. This is evident in the guidance for all sectors in the implementation report, where a table shows the alignment of recommended disclosures with other frameworks. It appears that CDSB frameworks are the only source which covers all of the recommended disclosures under the four core elements. I'd also like to flag that we have developed a companion document in 2013 with guidance on how to best communicate such climate change disclosures in mainstream reports. It summarizes four basic steps of how you can provide more meaningful disclosure in your annual reports, i.e. to evaluate, prepare, present, and review. Moving along, what are some examples of good reporting practice for you to look at? We often get asked for examples of good practices in environment and climate reporting in mainstream reports. In addition to frameworks, CDSB's analysis of FTSE 350 companies' disclosures on environmental information in their annual reports provides some real-life examples of good practice. At the same time, while material climate change-related disclosures in mainstream reports are not currently the norm, relevant information to dis such disclosures is already being provided through the CDP responses and, and company sustainability reports. This information, as said earlier, can form a foundation for disclosure within the mainstream report. I would now like us to revisit the earlier task force adoption curve or implementation path on page 42 of the final report. I would like to stress the point that the outcome sought by the TCSD will not be achieved overnight. We look forward to supporting, following, and analyzing companies' disclosures. We note that example disclosures is a key area for further work identified by the task force and one where we might make a further contribution as companies. Now we move to implementation. We also look forward to seeing a ratcheting up and ultimately a paradigm shift in corporate reporting processes and climate-related financial disclosures over time. Finally, subject to available resources and as a growing body of practice and evidence emerges, we plan to update our framework, making all the necessary refinements to fully support implementation of recommendations by organizations. Now back to Simon, who will briefly raise the TCFD commitment and open the floor to Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you, Nadine, and a huge thank you to all of our great speakers today. Um, as, as clearly, you, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, the TCFD recommendations is I've got it in front of me just now. It's just just uh, shy of 200 pages, so it's quite a significant um, piece of work, and it's uh, obviously very technical. And there are a lot of questions that have been coming through. Our chat line has been buzzing or pinging, uh, whatever the right word is, throughout with a number of questions, uh, which my team has been collating into main themes. Um, so I will take the easy questions, and then I'll hand the more complicated ones to uh, our panelists. The, so the, the first, um, I guess the two easy ones uh, for me, uh, were practical ones around will the slides be available after the call, and if so, how and where? So the answer is yes, we will be circulating the slides and the recording to everyone who signed up uh, to uh, the recording. Um, and the next uh, easiest one for me is, are there real examples of organizations reporting according to this framework? And if so, could web links be shared? So we've got some, uh, there's a slide that I will show afterwards, uh, which you'll be able to link from when you receive them, which has got some uh, great examples of good reporting, uh, um, which is the next slide, which is called the useful resources slide. So, uh, and as an example of a uh, company that has been using our framework well, that's Coca-Cola Hellenic, Hellenic Bottling Company. Um, so if you find their annual report uh, online, you'll be able to see how they've used their framework. But if you, you click through the link that we'll send afterwards, uh, it will take you to our website and there's lots of uh, useful resources um, on there. So the, the, the first more technical question, which I will uh, probably hand over to Gordon, is uh, what is the most important uh, first practical step for our company to take? I, uh, it's, good, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I really think the first, the, the, the most valuable tool is actually the people in your organization. And I think the first practical step, if, if you are uh, the individual responsible for preparing this response or, or, or even if, you know, frankly, the organization uh, hasn't really got that, it, it's working out who within the organization 
do you need to be working with in order to make this response? Um, and, and it's creating those connections um, because I do think that this is that this is a multidisciplinary uh, challenge. It needs input and expertise from the likes of people who've got you know financial background, risk management background. Um, it also needs to be discussed um, and explained with um, you, you know OGC, so you know general counsel. Um, this is going to be information that uh, uh, will have um, you, you know future implications. So there's a whole sort of element around reporting, um, and and also finding those you know whether it's a sponsor within uh, the audit committee or, or whether it's actually making a presentation to the audit committee to get their uh, to get their buy-in and their understanding. So I think I think that first step is is really a people step. Um, and once you've got there, you can uh, you can create a, a more detailed plan uh, with that buy-in. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, uh, Gordon. The the next question, which I'll hand through to Jane, is: What do I do if my information isn't quite ready at this stage? Uh, at the stage where we feel that we can publish it in our annual report. So information is incomplete. Uh, what's the best next step? Yeah, I would say that the. Um, the first thing that you need to look into is your process for data gathering, and potentially what you should do is to look at your gap, your your reporting gap that you have within your company. It might very likely be extended to also cover non-financial elements. And the next thing that you should look into is how you document your data. What I usually say is that you should have two kinds of data. You should have documentable data. That's the easy piece part. This is where you use ISA 500 requirements. That means that the documentation is from external sources, it's effectively controlled, it's direct evidence, and there are no inferences, it's in writing and original. That's the hard one. But in cases of, for instance, your scenario details, how should you work with that? And how should you work with your provisions and your off-balance sheet items? How are you to make sure that you have evidences for those? This is where you use probable data. And this is where you have to be still be able to defend the data that you have. And often it's a matter of that you, in writing, make sure you have your assumptions placed so that a reviewer can actually go back and see and verify that your um, assumptions are made right, they are not cherry-picked, and you have not combined things that cannot be combined. So it's a matter of that you start by making sure that your internal rules are made and you thereby also have to find what kind of evidences should they have in place out in the reporting entities. Then it's so much easier afterwards actually to ask the reporting entities to provide you at the headquarters with the evidences if you need it, or the auditors can look them up out in the entities. I think that, that, that would be my approach at least. Brilliant. Th thanks, Jane. That's really helpful. Um, and the, the last question that we will take uh, just now um, is going to be, uh, I'll probably pass this one over to Gordon, uh, do we have to, and they've underlined the have to, report this information in our annual report, and why can't I just keep it in my sustainability report? Okay. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a good, uh, uh, another good question. Um, I, th I think the, the, the answer probably lies in, t in two parts. You know, one, one is, um, so the, the TCFD recommendations talk about putting things in, in the mainstream report or the, you know, uh, from, a, from a UK perspective, you know, that means the annual report and accounts. Uh, the, the, the whole concept of what goes into an annual report and accounts, um, you know, is, is something that is, you know, changing year on year and, and there are various pushes and pulls uh, uh, around that. Um, we're, all, we're seeing uh, things like, for example, uh, Modern Slavery Act, gender pay gap. Pe people are being required to make um, single issue reporting and, and, and put that on their website rather than have to include that in their uh, annual report and accounts. And I, and I can see that direction of travel. Um, and it might be uh, you know, the case that, that actually your annual report and accounts includes a, a discrete summary, um, you know, a, a, a snapshot, as it were, 
um, of, uh, of your TCFD with, with more extensive reporting um, separately. We, we, we certainly see that. Um, but I think, I think there are a couple of, there's a couple of challenges around that. Um, one is, is around the timeliness of this information, and I think at the moment the annual report and accounts is considered, you know, at the point at which that becomes publicly available, um, that, that is a point at which that information for, for the company then becomes available, and I think it's very difficult to be referencing information in your annual report and accounts when you haven't then published uh, or reported the, the, the more uh, the additional information um, at, at the same time. So there's a point around the timeliness, and the, the second is actually more uh, the internal rigor. If something is in the annual report and accounts, it will have been prepared and reviewed um, by numerous individuals, uh, a lot of them very senior within that organisation. You know, and if it's not in the annual report and accounts, by de facto, it won't have had as much rigour. That is my personal experience of every organisation I have come across. Now, I'm not saying that uh, it isn't less important or, uh, or anything like that, and, um, but it, it's, a, it's a fact of life that if something is in the annual report and accounts, it will be looked at and challenged um, at, at a far more, uh, with far more rigor uh, than if it's not. And that, and that comes back to the whole concept of materiality. If something is material, it needs to be included and addressed in the annual report and accounts. Brilliant. Thank you, Gordon. I think I, I echo all of your points from my time in, when I used to work in accounting firms too. I've, I've come across that. Um, so I'd love to talk about this subject for uh, many uh, more hours, but I'm conscious of your time and we've only got about a minute or two left. Um, so I just wanted to make two final points before we left. The first one, which I've referred to about five minutes ago, um, is if you'd like to check some useful uh, resources for implementation, we, there are a number of valuable links uh, on this page, so we'll send the document as a PDF so you'll be able to click through uh, from it. And it covers, uh, you know, it's got our framework in it, it's got examples of uh, what the organization are doing, and it's also got more information around the, uh, the top, ten tips, top 10 tips from today, and also, uh, you know, looking at how can companies use financial accounting standards, for example, to deliver on the TCFD recommendations. Uh, we did a uh, presentation a couple of weeks about that. So please also, obviously, feel free to forward that to colleagues if it might be useful for them. And if you've got any questions on that, please do reach out to us because we'll be delighted to answer them um, uh, afterwards. And the, the last thing which I wanted to uh, make a reference to, which uh, Nadine mentioned it, uh, earlier, is uh, CDSB's new commitment, which we are launching next week. So with it, we will be showcasing companies who are committing to implement the TCFD recommendations within the next uh, three years. So uh, do keep an eye out on our website for more information. Uh, we've got a number of uh, companies who've... Uh, you know, already stated to us that they'll be committing uh, to doing it. So, um, and if ever you obviously want to sign up uh, yourself with your companies, you are more than welcome to <laughs> to do that too. So, finally, as it is uh, now 11 o'clock in the UK, thank you very much to all of our great panelists today. So, to Jane, to Nadine, and to Gordon, uh, thank you for all your insights, and of course, thank you to all of you for attending. We will be shortly sending the slides and the recording around, uh, and they will also be available on our website. So, thank you very much, and goodbye.